All right, today um, we are honored to have the John Bird Society uh, put on a presentation about the CONCON. It's Article 5 Convention. He can thoroughly explain it a lot better than I can. Um, here we have Hal Shirtliff and Daniel. What? I don't want to mess up the last name. <laughs> McGonagall. Uh, they're with the John Bird Society, and uh, as soon as I was ready. Okay, excellent. <coughs> Thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be involved here with the Old Keepers. I was at that meeting, what was about seven years ago, at Luxembourg Green. I think I probably met some of you folks there. I was also there this past April 19th when they had the lockdown on the Green. That was a very interesting <coughs> time. I was with Dan, and I'm the one that was detailed to pick up uh, Larry Pratt. And uh, driving from my home in West Roxbury to Logan Airport on a Friday morning usually is a little bit of an ordeal, but when they had the shelter in place, it was like a Sunday morning. It was, it was phenomenal. It was a very interesting experience. Anyway, before I go into my presentation, I'd like to make some recommendations, and, uh, and I'll also have a call to action at the end. But if you'd like to be in, uh, get some updated email, get on my email list. I'm just going to pass the clipboard around. You can put your, uh, your mailing address, email, phone number, whatever you like. And I always bring material at, uh, when I'm speaking at a, at a group or what have you. That's something that you see John Birch Society people do all the time. And you know, you ever hear those light bulb jokes? <coughs> How many John Birches does it take to change a light bulb? It takes three. One to set up the literature table. I mean, one to change a light bulb, and two to set up the book table, you see. So that's just because the printed word is very important, even though it's, uh, even though with all, with all the internet information we have. Um, we have been visiting, Dan and I, uh, my, my friend and colleague back here, we've been visiting state houses in New England giving press conferences and getting information out to the elected officials and some of the staff people, etc. We visited Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine. Uh, next week we'll be doing Vermont and Connecticut. I think we'll have a few some help here. And uh, we actually had a few press people show up. Can you believe that, right? And, uh, and then we're going to be doing something in Albany as well. So uh, what we do is we hand out this little 12-minute CD. It's actually, it was a video put in a CD format, but we tell the elected officials, pop it in when you drive on the way home. You know, most people aren't going to sit down for a short uh, DVD. But this is a DVD, or the DVD format. It's also up on YouTube, by the way. It's uh, state legislators in Oklahoma explaining how they were able to rescind all of their state's calls it's about two or three years old, but it's very good information. And we have lots of articles going back to the 80s on this issue. But what we've been using is a more recent one, uh, dealing with uh, Levin's uh, book that came out in August, which I'll be talking a little bit about, uh, pushing a con con and proposing 11 amendments, I think 11. I think we only have 27 altogether, but he's going to put 11 more, you see. And um, so we make this available as well. So uh, anybody is welcome to take one of these on the table. Uh, compliments of us. Uh, if you'd like to get more, you can get the two for a dollar. We also have it in PDF format, so you can copy and paste and get it out, out in cyberspace. And uh, unrelated to the Bird Society, it's independent. There's a wonderful summer camp program called Camp Constitution. And I saw some young people there. I thought, oh, I'll make sure I mention this. I happen to be the co-founder and the director, and it's a week-long program, and uh, we've had Old Keeper folks been involved with our camp. It's a great place to be. My whole family comes for the week. I've got information about the camp program. So, uh, and it'd be nice if we could even have some sponsors, you know, if people can help uh, get people in. We've never turned away any worthy young person or families for a lack of money. We've never, we never have to do. And last year we had about 100 people there. And our guest instructor, we have a number of instructors, but our featured instructor this year is Chris Ann Hall. If you're not familiar with her, look her up. She's quite a phenomenal individual. But we'll have uh, one of our writers from the New American Magazine, Tom Adlam, with Dan, will be giving a class. I might be, giving a, I might be doing a class on this. But uh, we're also taking an all-day field trip to, um, to um, Old Ironsides and Bunker Hill. <coughs> so, uh, and the cost of the tuition, it's all volunteer organization. And uh, everything, the cost is, includes everything, just about, except maybe some incidental. So please, uh, and help support it. You can say, I don't have any children. I don't, have, I don't know anybody. Help support it. Go to the Facebook page, copy it. When I post stuff, 
you know, help repulse. So, anyway, let's get into the, uh, the Constitutional Convention. Article 5. When I say CONCON, I mean Article 5, okay? I know there's some kind of semantic uh, deceptions going on here, and, but we, when I say Constitutional Convention, the sign says CONCON, we're speaking about an Article 5. Uh, so, this is a, a Facebook page, actually, of the side here. Choose Freedom, Stop CONCON. And I'm going to read you, and most of you are pretty familiar with the Constitution and Article 5. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for, the proposing, for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes, also as part of this Constitution, when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states, or by conventions of three-fourths. Keep that in mind, conventions, okay? Uh, thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress, provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses of the ninth session. That dealt with the importation of slaves, and was great because in 1807 they actually passed a law and went into effect to outlaw the importation of slaves. So that part was no longer required. And the only thing they can do is uh, to not, when it comes to the U.S. Senate, it says uh, to uh, that no state without its consent shall be deprived of equal suffrage in the Senate. And in those days, the Senate was, uh, senators were appointed by the legislatures up until the 17th Amendment. I'll get on that in a little bit. Let me give a brief history of the Article 5 movement, okay? 1787, the Constitution's right, I think it was New Hampshire, was the what, ninth state that ratified it, and it became the law of the land, right? Rhode Island was the last state, it was a little bit holdover, right? Uh, 1789, first proposal for CONCON. And by the way, for the first hundred years, every uh, every call for a convention was a general. There was no specific reason. They may have had a reason, but it was. Uh, and the Article Five was quite clear. No matter what the what the what the resolution may say, we want to make you know baseball the official pastime. We want to have uh, English whatever whatever they say. Whatever the states motivate the states to do that. It doesn't matter. It's the call that what matters, you see. And they may not even bring up that in a convention and say it's an amendment for a balanced budget. They may not even be discussed at a convention, you see. So these legislators who think we're going to save the planet by having uh, you know, this new amendment added, they may not even see that amendment, you see. So, uh, so for the first, uh, for the first so over 600 applications since 1789. Uh, from, from the late, I put 1915 to 1917, but it was actually before that, when uh, a lot of people were, a lot of states were trying to get uh, uh, an amendment to the Constitution to uh, have the direct election of senators, U.S. senators. This was the populist movement, right? That was one of the worst things the states ever did. The state governments <coughs> lost a lot of power when they did that. What happened was, Congress is promising the delegate of the, their, their, their voters, the world, right? The senators are the ones that actually had to go back to the states, to the state legislators, okay, here's the bill for all the stuff that Congress is, uh, you know, proposing. And they said, we can't do that. So they would say no to a lot of the proposals. Uh, and they were only a few states away from a convention, right? And then they passed the 17th Amendment. Uh, so, so those things are just down by the wayside. 1970s to 1980s, we were two states away from a constitutional convention. Okay. Uh, in the 70s, there was this notion of having an, having an amendment to balance the budget. And if you read the, the amendments then, the proposed amendments, and the ones you see today, it doesn't promise you a balanced budget. They say in the case of national emergency. And I think what Mark Levin said that in order, in order to have raised the budget, you have to have 26 of the states to sign on to it, right? which really totally changes the structure of the Constitution. And I tell people, you want a balanced budget? What about a constitutional budget? You know, I mean, I can borrow money and balance my, my own budget, right? Most of us have done that, unfortunately, over the years, right? We balance our budgets all the time. We just borrow the money. You see, so the idea of a balanced budget, we need a constitutional budget. That's what we should be proposing. Then we won't have to worry about amendments to the Constitution for balanced budgets, right? So, uh, uh, the John Birch Society was very, very busy. Uh, we started getting involved in this in, say, 84, 85, uh, showing people the folks behind the scenes that are pushing for this. And I'm going to get into that a little bit. If something sounds good, too good to be true, it usually is. 
And uh, we know that there are folks in this country that hate the U.S. Constitution, and they would love to see it rescinded. I'm going to talk about some of those people, right? So uh, a lot of our members and other groups, uh, Phyllis Schlafly's Eagle Forum, her group uh, was involved, and um, that we were able to get states to rescind their calls. And about 12 states rescinded their calls for a balanced budget amendment. And uh, then we realized that, you know, all these calls, there's no sunset clause uh, clauses on these calls that go back to 1787. So we were concerned that they could just say, hey, we have enough states for a convention. And we have like enough, like 40. Or what, we're not really sure, depending on, and uh, so we started trying to get states to rescind their calls. And it was the most difficult task in the world because most people could care less. There wasn't any uh, talk show host talking about it. Major party political parties weren't talking about it. There was only you know small groups on both sides for and against. I mean, I've been talking about it for years since 1988. I've been involved in this issue, and it was like people they just didn't want to hear it. It wasn't it wasn't sexy. It wasn't something that got a lot of media attention, right? But uh, we got about 12. I think it was 13 states that we were able to get them to clean, rescind all of their calls, and in New Hampshire. Uh, we worked for 20 years. Every two years, we'd introduce a new resolution to rescind, and they had like four calls going back to the 1920s or so. And we finally got it passed. In the Democrat House, first time they had Democrat majority since World War II, but it was Liberty the Republicans that are once had signed on the, on the resolution, and we passed unanimously in both houses. Okay? Uh, so about 12, 13 states rescinded all of their calls. So we had a nice little safety measure, safety, safety net here, right? Um, 2010, yeah, the, uh, we, we, we lived the, in New Hampshire, and it was interesting that as soon as we got that rescinded, within a matter of six months, it was a new call for a convention. But 2011, September, this is a very key date or an event for the more recent movement for an Article 5 convention. There was a conference at Harvard University, Harvard Law School. Uh, Danny, and I, Danny was on the outside handing out information. I had a friend on the inside. And I tried to get to be a member of the panel, right? Not that I need to be, I'm just someone from our organization, but uh, I offered myself and I thought, hey, I have the credentials. I've been testifying at hearings and know about this since 1988. It was actually the first project that I got involved in as a member of the John Birch Society. And uh, they did return my phone call, my emails. We did, however, get media credentials. So I showed up as a member of the New, uh, New American uh, Media Rep. And it was kind of interesting what I saw there. Kind of, uh, how, how these, uh, how the, the so-called left and the so-called right get together and sing kumbaya, okay? But that was the launch of the more, more modern uh, calls, the more recent calls. 2012, an organization called the Goldwater Institute, uh, named after the late Barry Goldwater, who, by the way, used to oppose one because he's since passed away, obviously. Um, he, he opposed the convention. It, uh, it, so the group, uh, the, uh, the group called something called Compact for America. And it took their spokesman about an hour and a half to explain what, exactly what they had. Anything that takes that long to figure out how it's done usually isn't going to get too much support. And um, they were actually giving seminars in different parts of the country. And uh, it was something like they were going to get states to send their governors and some of the legislators to Dallas, Texas on July 4th, where they would propose these new amendments. And that would have been considered a conference of the states. It wasn't quite an Article 5, but it could have been an Article 5. They even lost in their home court in, in Arizona where they're based. So that didn't really go anywhere. That organization is still very actively pushing Article 5, right? By the way, why would you want to go to Dallas, Texas on July 4th? I mean, Boston July 4th, uh, you know, a warmer, a cooler climate, but Dallas, Texas? Dallas, Texas is a good kind of go in the spring, but maybe not in uh, July 4th, right? 2013-2014, uh, we've seen a, uh, a brand new wave of resolutions. And over the years, it's been conservative type. I use that word in quotation marks though, when I say conservative. Uh, sometimes mostly neocon types, right? And a lot of people who are well-intentioned, who just sort of jump on a bandwagon, you don't want to look at the other side. And by the way, when I first heard about this, I thought it was a good idea, <clears throat> until I did a little research, you see. And uh, so uh, a group called Wolfpack. Anybody know what they are? You ever heard of a man named uh, Sent Erger? I think I'm pronouncing his name right, hopefully. Young Turks, yeah. progressive. Yeah. He founded this group called Wolfpack for the major purpose, main purpose of a CONCON, Article 5 Convention, right? Um, 
And uh, so, so that's where we stand today. Uh, uh, and they've actually introduced two resolutions in Massachusetts. They've introduced resolutions in uh, New Hampshire, and they've got a group in Maine. So it's interesting that on one of them, where we're combating Wolfpack people, we had a very interesting time. We testified in New Hampshire, and uh, they had a, a state rep, Timothy Smith. He was the Wolfpack guy that uh, he was a, not, a, not was a member, but he was sponsoring their bill. And he said that uh, over the years, there's been a couple of well-funded fringe groups that have scared people. We're not trying to scare anybody, folks. We're trying to warn. It's like Paul Revere didn't want to scare people. He, walked, he, was, a, he was a call to action, right? Uh, and he said, well-funded fringe groups. And I said, and so when I got up there, I said, uh, well-funded fringe groups. Huh? Anyone in that fit this description? And I said, we're probably talking about the John Birch Society. And it's interesting that people on the right will refer to us as a fringe group, too. They use the same terminology, the same argument. And uh, I said to him, well, if there's anybody who's well-funded, I could use a new van. My minivan has 220,000 miles, so I'd be happy to take a donation. And uh, so I got a few laughs out of that. Uh, anyway, uh, and, uh, so, uh, yeah, okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take their arguments, most of them, I, I think I've got this, if I missed any, let me know. You might have heard something I could add to this. And then refute each argument. I think that's the best way to go. Then I'll just show you some of the folks that have been involved and what we need to do. Um, arguments used by pro Article 5 supporters. An out of control federal government. I think most people would agree to that. We have no problem with that. We agree that we have an out of control federal government. We also have out of control state governments and out of control local governments, right? And many of these people who all of a sudden say we have an artificial government, we're the part of the problem. They've been supporting the politicians and candidates that made this possible. So you want to look at the blank, look in the mirror. What have you done to, to well, we have to support the lesser of two evils or whatever. Well, this is what you get when you support the lesser of two evils. You get evil, you see. So this, this is not, this isn't the, this isn't the, uh, the reason for an article five. This is a bad reason. Big money needs to be out of politics. Well, who's big money? The left doesn't want to have uh, the, the certain people supporting, right-wing supporters. Um, and when this guy, uh, Timothy Smith, the state rep, was testifying, he said, we need to have big money out of, out of politics. When I got the chance to testify, I said, we, we need to get big money out of this Article 5 convention movement. And I said, the Koch brothers on the right support a call for ConCon. -Con. They support groups like ALEC, A-L-E-C, I'll get into that in a minute. And George Soros supports Wolfpack. And boy, did they hollow in the back. It was kind of fun. You know, oh, what do you mean? That's not true. So after I finished, uh, one of the attorneys said, you need to show me proof. I said, well, give me a business card. I don't have it with me, but I'll get it for you. And I did. I showed him that uh, the founder of this Wolfpack group, uh, Seth Berger, and I'm not pronouncing his name right, uh, he was uh, formed something called Young Turks. And if you look at the media consortium that George Soros started, and you look at, go to their website, all the groups they support, guess what? Young Turks are there, see? So the guy who founded Wolfpack is funded by George Soros. So uh, uh, anyway, so uh, big money. Well, if free people get together and form an entity, should we be able to pool our resources and support people we choose? So, uh, so, uh, so what do they mean big, big money? What's the definition of big money? They want to have, by the way, federal funding of elections. And by that way, they, they will only uh, qualify candidates. So certain people may not be qualified, so they never even get a chance to run. Um, uh, Article 5 convention cannot be a runaway. And that's something that a lot of folks, we, we, what we say is that the original convention under the Articles of, of Confederation, and it was Article 13 of the Articles of Confederation that said that in order to have amendments, you have to have all 13 states, majority of the state, all the states, 100%. The delegates were sent, some of them were given some kind of broad authority. This was a sovereign body. And we're very glad we got what we got. There's one of the arguments, oh, you people think the Constitution is illegal. We've never said that. That's a lie. That's what a clever attorney is trying to refute our cases comes up with that. We never said that, ever said that. So uh, when you hear that, that's, uh, there may be some people that say that, but we don't say it. And I don't know anyone in the, uh, the, uh, the Article 5 opponents have said that. So we never made that. If you believe it's illegal, then you wouldn't even get involved in the process, would you? 
right? I mean, you wouldn't, you know, because you have, by doing this, you're, this is a legitimate process here, right? Um, and it can't be a runaway. Well, this sovereign body said, uh, we don't have to, we are, we are, we're the ones that form the national government. We can do what we kind of like, right? So it is possible that the delegates at this convention can change the rules. They can ignore their instructions that they get from their states. Or they can abide by them. We don't know that, do we? We don't even know these delegates will be, right? And, um, and by the way, you can go by the process and you can, have a, you can amend the Constitution to oblivion without having to form a new one. But they can, maybe they can change the mode of ratification. Um, in Congress, there's a, uh, the uh, Congress under Article One, Section 8 has to have the, uh, all that's proper and necessary. So Congress, some legal scholars like Edmund Vera says Congress will make the rules. <coughs> these, are, these folks are saying, oh, Congress is so bad, but they're going to be making the rules for the Article 5? Do you really want to do that? They had a meeting, some of these Article 5 supporters, the conservative ones, had a meeting in Mount Vernon. They had about 100 people there. They had no legal, legal authority. They can agree, they can agree, they can shake hands and they can write documents, but once they get to the convention, they can throw those things right out the window. Okay? So it can be a runaway, however you define runaway. We're of the opinion that it's going to be a planned runaway convention. In other words, it's not going to be just a bunch of crazy amendments that will be passed, but the folks behind this have a plan. They want to have a parliamentary system. Right? They want to be able to have, do away with the electoral college. They want to have the parties have complete control of who runs for office. And we read their writings going back to the uh, 1970s. There's a constitution called a New States Constitution for New States of America. I'm not suggesting that's going to be replacing it, but some of the things they want there. Um, they want to have do away with a supermajority to ratify treaties. They want to have members of the cabinet serve as the Senate, serve in the House. Totally restructure our unique form of government. Okay, uh, three fourths of the states need, needed to pass need to pass uh, proposed amendments which would effectively stop any unreasonable amendments from being passed. Well, this Wolfpack guy used that same argument. No unreasonable amendments would be passed. What is unreasonable to us a progressive, so-called progressive? What's reasonable to us? Right? And also, as I mentioned when I read Article 5, Congress can have ratifying committees. So state legislators may not even hear this. So uh, I would say uh, it's reasonable to repeal the 16th Amendment, isn't it? Most of us would agree in this room, the one that gives us income tax. Do you think a progressive will find that reasonable? And I contend that we do a lot of unreasonable things without a con con, do we? 46 states, no, yeah, 46 states, sight unseen, adopted Common Core because they were getting money. Republican states, liberal states, Democrat states, right? All 50 states have been implementing Agenda 21. All 50 states, a UN proposed, a UN document that's been filtered down and been implemented, and only two states in the last four or five years has said no to it, and it was a bitter fight. And there's many, many more examples. States do a lot of wrong things. Look at look at Massachusetts, right? So don't tell me that states won't do anything unreasonable. They do it all the time. See, um, the media would report on this event. Oh wow, that makes me feel very secure. I can go to sleep now knowing that the media will get to the bottom of this. I can give you a recent example of how I know that won't happen. Uh, we had a press conference. There was a press conference in Maine uh, in the middle of December. <coughs> it was sponsored by For the People of Maine, or We the People of Maine. And they were promoting an Article 5 convention. They wanted to have an amendment that would do away with the notion of personhood, uh, corporation personhood. They, I don't think, they didn't say Wolfpack, but they're the same thing the Wolfpack people were pushing, right? And uh, they were, at that time, the, the uh, legislator was out of session, and they had a nice article in the Bangor Daily News. And I got wind of it, a friend of mine up there has a radio show, The Aristic Watchman, which, by the way, you should tune in, you can get on a line, great show. Um, he told me about it, he sent me the link to the article. So I said, we have to count this as soon as we can. And we went up there in early January. We sent this, I called this guy on the phone twice, emailed him, he got a news release right on his desk, right 
about maybe uh, you know a two-minute walk from where the press conference was, and uh, he never showed up. So after the press conference, I went to his office. There he was. His name was Christopher Cousins, typing away. And I said, "Oh, you missed our you missed our car. You missed our, our news conference." Oh, I thought that was yesterday, and I was on another assignment when he sent somebody else, right? Well, here's the information that we use, and so on and so on. He said, oh, definitely do a follow-up, and that was what, Dan, January 9th? No follow-up yet. So the media will probably not be, will not cover this or give you all the information you need to know. I'd be very biased, right? Oh, this is one I just saw recently from one of the groups. It is a remedy that the founders gave us, a gift. Constitution was the gift they gave us, and now this it is a it is in the Constitution, and one of the arguments that they say is that the founders, would, when they wrote amendments, they never it in Paul's imaginations would think that the people today would so misconstrue them. Well, if they can misconstrue amendments and interpretations of the Constitution, could they misconstrue an Article Five convention? And they used to, you know, today. So, uh, states need to restore the balance of power. I believe, I agree with that, but what states are stepping up and saying, we need to restore the balance of power as they get their hand out from, to the federal government? You want to get your, you want to get your power back? Say no. Say no to Common Core, tell them to take their money and shove it. Okay? Nullification on the Article 10. That's the better gift that the founders gave us, right? And uh, people like Mark Levin, oh, you're a neo-confederate, if you believe that. You see, they don't want to touch that. And by the way, I'm not here to speak so much about the Article 10, but it should be addressed. Article 10 was used to nullify the fugitive slave laws. How's that neo Confederates? How's that about the end? Just recently, the Real ID Act. You remember that? 2007, 2008 or so, maybe a little bit sooner. And it was Jen Coffey, Second Amendment sister lady, that led the that New Hampshire said no, and people on both sides, left and right. And a number of states opted out, and guess what? This was the government said, well, we'll give you a few more years. It has not been implemented. It's, but some states have already adopted it, but a lot of states said no. Uh, so that's what's happened. So that's that's the solution there, right? The balance of power. The Constitution, it's all spelled out the Constitution, right? It's in the 110th Amendment. It says that the powers not granted to Congress or to the federal government or denied to the states are, are, are those for the, are retained by the states. It's pretty simple, okay? So, uh, States have con cons all the time without any problem. This would be state constitution conventions. And um, I said, well, this is apples and oranges. These are two different things right here when you propose amendments to your state. Well, look at Massachusetts Constitution. By the way, the oldest constitution in the world. And it's got a whole lot of amendments. And it's kind of confusing. The, the original part is beautiful. It talks about morality and piety and virtue are all necessary for free people. It's the duty to worship the great architect of the universe. And I'm talking about Bechtel Corporation, by the way, you see. You would never see anybody, they'd strike all that stuff out if they had a, a, a more recent. So uh, so that is not a good argument here. And I've had people say, yeah, New Hampshire had a con con in 68, and boy, it changed the Constitution so much. So maybe that's not the best argument, okay? We have 26, this is the Republican, the conservative side. We have 26 states with Republican majorities. So that's the safety net. Nothing to worry about, folks, right? That makes me sleep well at night. We get guys like John McCain are going to make sure that everything in this convention goes smoothly, right? Would you trust John McCain's or his worldview, people like him, at an Article 5 convention? He is a big, people like him are a big part of the problem. So, and what, and since these resolutions have no, uh, no uh, sunset clause, a timeline, yeah, even if all of these state Republicans were all constitutionalists, what will happen two years from now? Oh, four years, it can be voted out. So that's a bad argument right there. This was something that Mike Farris uh, promoted in his uh, uh, refuting our, our, uh, our views. The founders' generation wasn't as moral as people believe. Well, we're all sinners saved by grace, and yeah, I'm sure they, were, they weren't all, uh, but would you compare that generation? Could you, a man of George Washington's caliber, presiding over this con con? Anyone like that? I know probably a couple, right? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. We've always been uh, there's always been evil people throughout the history of mankind, but I think we've we've probably cornered the market a little bit on that in this this present generation. See, the Supreme Court has reinterpreted the Constitution, so we need a batch of new amendments to set things right. 
If the Constitution is mis uh, misinterpreting something, that doesn't mean the Constitution's wrong. It means the Supreme Court is wrong, right? That's nonsense. That means every time a bad decision comes along, we have to have a con con for another amendment. The remedy for that, by the way, is right in the Constitution. You look at Article 3 of the Constitution. Okay, and of course, if you if you read Mark Levin's book, you, you know, and he's a pretty smart guy, you think, oh, we got it all. He didn't mention this. Members of the Supreme Court are there for good behavior. And also, um, Congress can limit the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Most people don't know that. You don't need the president to sign on. And have they done that? Yeah. Look at labor laws. Supreme Court doesn't rule. No, oh, there's some court structure, but Supreme Court won't take that. So that's how you rein in the Supreme Court. See, not having more amendments, which will be mis misinterpreted again, right? Um, oh, this is the one, uh, if you go to the Convention of the States, frequently asked questions, this is a beautiful, this is beautiful. Uh, the best argument we have against one is that if the federal government isn't obeying amendments now or the Constitution now, why would the same batch of people start obeying new ones? Could you imagine Nancy Pelosi, oh my goodness, you're about to have a convention. We're going to have to start obeying the Constitution if they really get one. It's ludicrous, you see. Um, uh, so what they, what they contend is that um, we're going to write these amendments in a way that cannot possibly mis be misinterpreted. Well, if you're a postmodern thinking person like most of the folks in D.C., nothing means any, anything, mean, you know, there's no definition. Everything can be redefined. Everything's up for grabs. So these folks are smarter than the founders, and they're going to outsmart the progressives. Well, I'm, they really, I'm amazed that they could do that, right? That's a bad argument. The left and some people on the right use this argument. The Constitution is outdated and no longer valid for our times. I'm going to be talking about this lady, uh, Professor Meg Penrose, a law professor, it says, we no longer wear the same clothes we do what people did back in 1787 and so forth. We no longer eat the same kinds of foods. And what's that got to do with our Constitution, lady? Intelligent people sit there and nod their heads and think, yeah, you're right. The Constitution deals with human nature. Does human nature change because of the date or because of the inventions and technology? So let's say, well, yes, free speech was a bad thing, but we should do away with that because 1787, it was good as not. Are you kidding me? You know, what about trial by jury? You want to get rid of that too because that's outdated? The Constitution was designed to check man, man's nature. That's what it was all about. It had a, it established a patent office for inventions. They figured that people were going to invent stuff. And it also, um, it also, yeah, so, so you can definitely, and also, allowed amendments to be added, but not something frivolous. It was a difficult process. So uh, the Constitution is as is, is current now as it was 200 years ago. Uh, look at the Ten Commandments. Are those obsolete? Because they were written you know, several thousand years ago. So that's not a very good argument at all. And we hear people say that. They need to be corrected on that pretty quick. People on our side, right? New amendments will force the federal government to obey this Constitution. Right, I kind of addressed that a little bit earlier, right? They will, all of a sudden, they will start obeying ones. Well, uh, and oh, by the way, to, to write amendments that cannot be misinterpreted, the right to keep their arms shall not be infringed. Hmm. That sounds pretty clear to me, right? The freedom of speech, the, the notion that you can't pray in a school is unconstitutional. Well, somehow someone did misconstrue that, right? We're going to change that, you know? When these postmodern people, what did Bill Clinton say? What is is? How you define is? See? So uh, you're not going to be able to write anything that cannot be misconstrued. I guarantee it. Okay. This is the one that the Wolfpack people. Congress has a six percent approval rating, right? Well, and I said that when I testified, I said we have a remedy that's better than Article Five. They're called elections. And all the people as a panel, they elect the Republicans and Democrats. Yeah, we like that. So if you have a lousy member of Congress. Get a new one. Every two years, you can have a revolution at the ballot box. That was signed that way. And Congress, the House of Representatives, is the most powerful branch. People say the, the, the president's the most powerful man in the free world or whatever. That, that's not his job description. That's nonsense. The president has very few duties and very few powers. If people ever read that Constitution, they'd know that. Congress, House of Representatives, all oh, they can impeach. All money bills, they declare war. Of course, they haven't done that in a while. Not that we want to declare war. 
So this is a bad argument too. Everyone's congressman is bad except for mine because I'm getting the goodies from my member of Congress, right? But everybody else is bad, see? So that's not a good argument, right? We have to do something to solve the problem. We have to do something, right? I remember, uh, I'm, I'm almost 55 years of age. I remember the wage and price controls on Nixon, the conservative Nixon. Some of us, might, some of you guys might remember that. And the, the argument was, at least he's doing something. He's making matters worse, but so what? He's doing something. That is an emotional, uh, how about this one? We can make history. They're trying to sell it. Yeah, we're going to make history. You know. But we're making history by restoring the Constitution. So we'll, we'll appeal to your emotions too. We can, and it's okay to do that as long as you're guided by your, your brain first, right? Uh, only well-financed fringe groups oppose an Article 5. And I mentioned this too, right? Yeah. Um, and when I, was, when I was able to testify, I, I was quoting uh, Judge Bork opposes the Congress. He's deceased now. I said, Warren Burger, Supreme Court, former Supreme Court Justice. I said, well, these guys well-funded fringes. You know, lots of people have opposed an Article 5. And what's a fringe group? Right? That's a group that we don't like. We call it fringe, right? What's fringe yesterday is today. I mean, I remember in 1988, most people had no idea who Ron Paul was. Complete, who's this guy, Ron Paul? And then next thing you know, this is a gigantic movement. He was no longer fringe, was he? See, because people understood what he had to say, and a lot of people liked what he had to say, and he was no longer fringe. So that's, that's an arbitrary term as well, what, what is fringe. And if it's a fringe group that has a lot of influence, it can't be fringe, can it? Right? But it's, it's a term that's used to discredit legitimate opposition. That's, that's what that term is. Okay, uh, so here are some groups that promote in Article 5, past and present. ALEC is the American Legislative Exchange Council, mainly a Republican group. And if I looked at their website, I might agree with almost everything they have to say. Well, a lot of it anyway. But this one, dead against. Okay. Um, friends of an Article 5, go to their website because they have, they've done a lot of research. They've got every single proposed resolution that's been ever introduced. You can find, you know, find it. Uh, so it's fascinating. Uh, great. I disagree with what they stand for, but I actually go to them for research because they get a lot of people who work here. Uh, I should, it's a I mean, convention in the state, COS. I put Congress, I've got to correct that. This is the group that uh, was founded by Mark Meckler. Now, does anybody know who Mark Meckler is? 